things pertaining to the book of Acts. Some of the Acts of some of the apostles written by Luke as a follow-up, or maybe call it a second volume from the Gospel of Luke. And we were noticing certain things about it. And one of the interesting things um, uh, are some notable firsts that are found in the book of Acts, notable firsts. Uh, you have the first gospel sermon preached, um, chapter 2, of course, the beginning of the church, verses 14 through 40. I always like to emphasize that Peter is standing up with the 11 and what Peter's doing, the other apostles are doing, and Luke was inspired to record Peter's sermon. Uh, the audience would say, how here we, uh, every man now on tongue, and yet the apostles were all speaking as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. You have, uh, with the church starting, you had the first conversions, Acts 2.41. Uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, you have the first healing miracle after the church was established, or you might say under the Great Commission. Uh, chapter 4, we mentioned some of this earlier. You had the first persecution of the saints. Um, this was, of course, quite limited there in Jerusalem, but nevertheless, it was. Uh, then you have, with the case of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, the first uh, sin in the church and uh, that's recorded, and thus the first divine, and I emphasize divine, I guess you'd say, corrective discipline uh, in the church, and uh, much could be said uh, about that. Uh, I think it's interesting that that uh, first sin involved uh, covetousness led to lying. You have in chapter 6, verses 1 through 17, uh, and I'll talk about this just a little bit, the first deacons uh, selected. Some people will disagree in saying, well, they're not called deacons, but the Greek word diakonos, uh, serving tables, the idea of serving. And they said, well, you had no elders, so we can have deacons today without elders. A little bit different. You had inspired apostles there. And uh, just like we have our New Testament of Jesus Christ, the Apostles' Doctrine, written down for us to follow today, you had the Holy Spirit within the Apostles. And the church knew that they were ambassadors of the court of heaven. That's why they followed the Apostles' Doctrine. So even if you still don't want to call them deacons, as are set out as far as Paul is concerned in First Timothy, the qualifications for them, you still have them... Uh, serving, the apostles making it very clear that we have a work that only we can do, and we can't allow this work to take us away from what we and we only can do. So they found dedicated, faithful men who met certain qualifications that they appointed. They also uh, had the people follow those qualifications and select those men then once they, according to those qualifications, had selected those seven men, they brought them to the apostles and they appointed them uh, about the matter. And since it involved the Grecian widows, as it says in the King James Version, being neglected in the daily ministration, then you'll notice that every one of those men that were chosen were Grecians. Now, when it says Grecians here, it doesn't mean uh, Greek by blood. It means they're the Jews of the dispersion. Paul would have been like that, really, because he was of uh, Tarsus and Cilicia. And that's what they mean. The Jews there in Jerusalem, Judea, always looked sort of out of the corner of their eye at their Hellenist brethren, and that posed a problem then when they came, not anticipating staying but a certain period of time to keep the feasts that the law of Moses required. And then, lo and behold, they learn about the gospel in the church. They obey the gospel. And then staying longer than they had intended, then food began to be a problem. 
there always was a host of widows because a man did well to live to be 35 or 40. And um, so you had a lot of them. And they were, remember at that time, uh, so concerned about helping their brethren that they were uh, selling what they had and, and using it by giving it to the apostles and, and then it being distributed. So there was this complaint that arose among the Hellenist or Greek Jews because they felt like that uh, favoritism was being shown and the native widows were being taken care of and their widows were being neglected. I've always thought it interested that those who had the complaint were assigned by the apostles to straighten it all out uh, by finding men among themselves who were uh, good, spiritual, faithful people and assigning that work to them and the apostles appointing them over that matter. Uh, leaving that, we have, of course, the first Christian martyr, Stephen, in chapter 7, 54 through 60. And then we have the first uncircumcised Gentile converts in chapter 10, 44 through 48. And then Peter in chapter 11 recounts what happened, the household of Cornelius to the Jews who were Christians there in the church in Jerusalem. Um, you have to go over to chapter 11 and verse 26 before you find the first time the disciples were called Christians in the church at Antioch of Syria. Um, you have then the um, church in Syria, Antioch, sending out Paul and Barnabas on the first preaching tour. I, I think sometimes we forget, I've mentioned it several times, but the church in Jerusalem, a Jewish church, never sent out anybody um, to do what the church in Antioch did, which was to work among the Gentiles. And of course, we mentioned last week in Acts 9 is the first account out of three that are in the book of Acts of Paul's conversion. So they didn't begin to do that until they had the apostle to the Gentiles selected by God and in place. And then they had Cornelius, who was the first, as I said, uncircumcised Gentile convert. And then they go out from the church, Gentile church in Antioch of Syria to preach the gospel. And then, of course, you have the first preaching later on done out of Asia and in Egypt in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, uh, or rather uh, in chapter 19, um, 17, 16. And uh, that was, of course, after the Jerusalem conference. And you had uh, in 16, you'd already had the disagreement between Paul and Barnabas as to whether to take John Mark on the second tour. And the dissension was so sharp between them, they went their separate ways. And uh, Barnabas took Mark and went to Cyprus, and Paul took Silas, went back through the other, uh, visiting the churches that he and Barnabas had established on the first tour. Remember what we said last week. Now, this, this just happened like this summer, and then this fall they went back. There were years involved in this uh, going to and fro, and by the time Paul gets to Rome in roughly 61, uh, you've had some 20 years involved in Paul's work when it comes to the preaching tours. Leaving the first, which are notable, I think, there that we mentioned, some 11 of them, we see then the outpouring, for lack of a better way to put it, of the Holy Spirit in miraculous form in the book of Acts. Um, outpouring in our mind sometimes, in fact, maybe a lot of the times, doesn't convey the thought it did in their minds. We think of having, say, a cup of water, a glass of water, whatever you would call it, or something that's liquid, and pouring it out of a container on something else, and that tends to be the way we think of an outpouring. But the Holy Spirit is a divine person, the third person of Godhead. And so when it talks about outpouring of the Spirit, it's talking about what the Spirit did. When you look at Acts chapter 2, you had the baptismal measure outpouring. Uh, when you see God saying that it is his will for the uncircumcised Gentiles at the house of Cornelius to hear the gospel, then there is a similar outpouring 
or baptism of the Spirit, straight from heaven, showing Peter and those he took with him that God approved of the uncircumcised Gentile being preached to. And uh, again, let me emphasize, this is this temporary, provisional, infant stage, and transition stage of the church. Uh, you say, why didn't the Lord get upset with the Jewish church for not immediately taking the gospel on the day of Pentecost to those uncircumcised Gentiles? Because God was working with them, it took a little while for them to ever get to the Samaritans. In fact, it took persecution in Jerusalem to get them to do what God told them to do in the first place, which was go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, they weren't. But God had ways of handling that, so he brought the great persecution beginning after the death of Stephen. Paul was one of the ring leaders in it, and that sent them packing, and they went everywhere. And as they went, they preached the word, and that's when Philip went to the Samaritans. And notice he was not a Judean Jew. This is one of the seven chosen to serve tables. He was a Hellenist. He was used to working around people that were not Jews, that were anything but, and thus God chose him in his infinite wisdom to carry the gospel to um, the Samaritans. And of course, it's interesting that he called him away of what we would say was a very highly successful gospel meeting in Samaria and sent him down to preach to another one who was very limited in his uh, service to God under the law, and that was the Ethiopian eunuch, because he was a eunuch. He did not have uh, as close association in going up to the temple as the Jew did. And so he rejoiced because in understanding the gospel, not only did he understand the Messiah had come and uh, the way of salvation had been made for him, but that he was a full-fledged, uh, if you'll call it that, uh, member and fully reconciled to God and justified his sight. So you have this kind of thing taking place, as the church in Jerusalem, made up primarily of Jews, gradually have it thumped in their thick heads that the gospel is truly for all. So God bore with those people in the time he was uh, gradually revealing the New Testament, even as he bore with Peter and others. So there's almost 10 years went by before a Jew ever preached to uncircumcised Gentile. And so that's important to understand. Now, this is as good a time as any since we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in miraculous form as it's presented by Luke in the book of Acts to realize that you don't just have a book of conversions and some non-conversions. You do not just have in the book of Acts the early church carrying out the Great Commission. You have all of that, but you also have in this transition period moving from the Jews being under the law of Moses to their fully understanding of what it meant to be under the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ. He worked with them and gradually led them along. So you have Jews dealt with for a while and proselytes. Then you have the persecution. And lo and behold, they go to the Samaritans and no Jew would have had a thing to do with Samaritan. We know that from the parable of the Good Samaritan. We see then Peter's attitude when God told him to arise, Peter, kill and eat, and offered him all those things the law condemned and would not allow a Jew to eat. And you see how hard it was for him to grasp what was happening, how God worked straight from heaven in uh, the house of Cornelius to show him that you don't just preach to Jews and proselytes. You can preach and ought to preach and must pre preach to those who are uncircumcised Gentiles. And, of course, in between all of that, you had Paul converted. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, so you have this gradual development in this infant stage of the church with the miracles being worked. And by those miracles of revelation, uh, they came to understand what we now have as the completed New Testament. But it wasn't all just given to them overnight. As situations arose where the revelation was needed, then they were given the needed revelation. And God worked with them in their understanding. And of course, some of them wouldn't go along with it. So you have then the Judaizing teachers going up to the Gentile church or down to the Gentile church in Syria and Antioch and trying to bind the 
on the males to keep the being circumcised, keep the law. Paul knew better than that because because he had a debate with them right there and they withstood them. Then they go to Acts 15, they go down and find out where all this is coming from. And they learn then it was coming from Pharisees that had believed that had become Christians. And of course, the Judaizing teacher rose up then, and Paul had problems with them, I suppose you could say, the rest of his life. So he not only had unbelieving Jews who caused him a problem, but you had in the church uh, Jews that were converted to Christ, but they did not like it when it had to do with taking in uncircumcised Gentiles on the same basis that they became Christians in believing, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and being baptized in Christ for their issue of sin. So you've got that gradual development in the book of Acts. It sometimes never gets pointed out as God bore with them as they, as they changed over from the law to the truth. Now today, if you were not preach the gospel to a Gentile, uh, if you were a Jew and a faithful Christian, you'd be sinning immediately. But during these times of transition, God bore with them till the full revelation of the gospel of Christ in the New Testament fully revealed. And you see that brought out in the book of Acts. You, this is not unusual because you have in um, transition of, the, of Israel over from patriarchy to the law of Moses. Remember, they were, after they received the law, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai one whole year. Now, I wonder what they were doing. Well, though they had the whole law given to them and they understood this is God's will and he's making of us a great nation and we're to live by this law. You can't live by what you don't know. And just because you have the whole thing given to you doesn't mean you know what all it is. And if you want to see what they were doing, just go back and read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and I'd say Deuteronomy alone shows you what they were studying. They had to know what the duty of the Levites were, what the priests were, what the high priest was to do. They had to make all those clothes that they wore. They had to make the tabernacle, had to make it as God told Moses, according to the pattern, showed to thee in the mount. So they had a year of transitioning from patriarchy to the law of Moses during that time. Uh, they very well couldn't go into a tabernacle that wasn't there, though they had a law that said this is the way under the law that you worship God by the Levites and then by the priests of the Levites and so on. So it's not unusual to have a transition. But uh, they, this is one thing the book of Acts does, and it transitions then from Christ, his life on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and his death, burial, and resurrection, and the beginning of Acts, his ascension, and then uh, him at the right hand of God ruling and the church established and what it did all the way up for about 30 years. And then you have all the letters. And I tell you again, as I did last week, you remove the book of Acts and the knowledge of it from your mind and you'll have a tough time with those letters. I mean, you couldn't understand them, but there'll be a lot you won't understand or figure out that are it's much clearer because of the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit played a part in all of this. Um, that God's, God's re, re, the person of the Godhead that does the revealing of the mind of God is the Holy Spirit. When you think, if you want to talk about it, of the assignments of each person of the Godhead, for lack of a better way to put it, then you've got the Father, who is the first person, who is the originator of truth. You've got the Son, the second person of the Godhead, who is the executive of the Father's will. In other words, it wasn't the Father's responsibility to become flesh and dwell among us. It was the Son's responsibility to do that. That is, the second person of the Godhead. And then who was the revealer and the organizer and the confirmer? It was the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you look back at the beginning of things in the natural creation, you'll see that each one of them had that kind of, of um, work to do in the creation of the world. And if you look to the creation of the spiritual world, the church, it's the same thing. It is a mistake to think that the early members of the church at this time and for some years thereafter that they thought of the Holy Spirit in any other way than what we read about him in the New Testament. 
that is, the things that he did. And it was basically connected with two things, the working of miracles to confirm the revelation that he made to be from heaven and not from man. And as you read things today about the Holy Spirit's work, then you may get the idea that, well, he's, he's doing something today. Uh, and I'm not talking about providence, what he does on our behalf, behind the scenes. But I'm talking about when it comes to informing us of right and wrong, informing us of the will of God, then the Holy Spirit still does that. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Um, he always, just say God in general in this sense, but the Holy Spirit in particular I'm thinking of now, he always operates according to a rule of law. And a rule of law is set out in the signs of ideas of the vehicles of thought, which, of course, collectively is the New Testament. That's why it can be called the sword of the Spirit and the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So when you're convicted that Christ is the Son of God by the Word of God, which is also the seat of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, then you're also convicted by the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean he operates directly on you. It means he operates through a rule of law, and that is the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament, the faith for which we are to contend, the gospel system. So in those days, when it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it has the idea that the Holy Spirit came upon them and provided for them that which normal humans could not provide for themselves. He worked miracles. Uh, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Jesus had told them they would be able to do these things. So how was it uh, that they were to know? Well, let's just take this, this example. Go to the house of Cordelius. Are miracles involved there? Well, certainly they are. In fact, with Cornelius, who it says was a devout man, and by the way, the same Greek word that's translated devout there is the same Greek word that Luke used in describing the Jews gathered on the day of Pentecost, devout Jews gathered from every nation under heaven. So he wasn't a, a Jew, a, a Gentile like you read of in Romans 1, who didn't care about God, did not desire to retain God in uh, his knowledge, uh, their knowledge. But he was one already praying to God. And thus he was informed that your prayers have come up his arms before God. And then he informed him to do what? To send to Joppa to one whose surname is Peter. He dwells at the Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. And thus he did. He'll tell you words and so forth. Well, he goes there, and what's happening as God puts all this together? Well, Peter then has his vision. It happened three times. Peter's sitting on top of the house trying to figure out what's going on when they arrive at the gate. And so when you put all that together, then Peter knew that this was from God, that he was to go with these uncircumcised Gentiles who normally he wouldn't associate with at all. So he went. He gets over to Cornelius. And, uh, well, I won't go over the whole story. You know it. And uh, thus he says uh, that God has showed me that while he's cleansed, God shouldn't call, that I shouldn't call common. And then as he began to speak, you find that as you read not just chapter 10, but chapter 11, where he reports to the church in Jerusalem about the conversion of the uncircumcised Gentiles. He says, as I began to speak, is when the Holy Spirit fell on me, the outpouring that God uh, directly from heaven, not through laying on of apostles' hands, but directly from heaven put his stamp of approval of, and, and, and uh, the imperative of the church preaching the gospel of the uncircumcised Gentiles. And what was proof of it? Well, they began to speak with all sorts of languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And the only time that Peter could think of that he had seen such a thing before, and he says it, as on us, the apostles, at the beginning. By the way, there it shows you that the church began in Acts 2. Peter says at the beginning, Luke records it. So um, that's why we can say the church began, one reason, more than one reason. But one reason we know the church began on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. Peter called it the beginning, and if an inspired apostle of Christ and called it the beginning, uh, like he said concerning baptizing the Gentiles, who am I that I could say otherwise? So then he, in what, verse 48 of chapter 10, 
says, who can forbid baptism? And uh, he commanded them to be baptized. And he said, who can forbid it when God's already put his stamp of approval for them hearing and believing and obeying the gospel directly from heaven, bypassed all men. God said it. So the Holy Spirit's involved there, and he empowered them to speak with, as I said, languages they'd never studied. Uh, they were enabled, that is, various people, not only the apostles, but others to work miracles. And normally the gifts were in the early church through the laying on of the apostles' hands, 1 Corinthians 12. All nine of them are listed there. The apostles, each apostle had all nine of them. And one more, the power to lay hands on members of the church and impart these gifts. So miracles are there because the truth had to be fully revealed. It was going to be revealed over a period of years. And as the church was ready to receive it, and as God in his infinite wisdom saw fit, it was time to give it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, for we prophesy in part, we know in part. In other words, as, as they were guided in part and partial, as they needed it, God gave them the guidance directly from heaven. So they had to have time for all of that to happen. That's why he says, uh, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And Paul longed for the day when the miracles would end because that would imply that the full revelation had been given. And today people want miracles. Well, do you realize then if the church had miracles in it, the full revelation of God wouldn't be over with yet. So that transition period was the infant stage of the church. And it allowed then, or it permitted, or demanded really, the uh, miraculous gifts of the Spirit. So you have all nine of them, 1 Corinthians 12, and uh, all of that. Um, so this was the beginning of the Christian Acts 2, of the Christian dispensation. And it will go on till the end of time as far as earth is concerned and the preaching of the gospel and the church doing what the New Testament requires the church to do to be faithful. Concerning the uh, Samaritans, you remember that Philip, who could work miracles but was not an apostle of Christ, thus was not baptized in the Holy Spirit, had gone there working miracles to confirm the gospel that he preached, and he had many people obeying the gospel. And then Peter and John came down to Samaria, and it was for a given purpose, to lay hands on the church so that there would be the miraculous gifts to guide them in living faithful Christian lives. It says in Acts 8, 5 through 25, uh, in that passage that they received the Holy Spirit when they laid hands on them. Well, in what sense did they, did they receive it? Well, they received it in the sense that they could work miracles. They did not receive it in the same measure of power and the parakletos or comforter relationship that was for the apostles and the apostles alone. But they did receive the gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, all nine of them. And all of this demonstrates that a great many Samaritans had believed the preaching of Philip and things, as the scripture says, pertaining to the kingdom of God. And they were accepted by God uh, because Peter and John came and laid their hands on them and showed that God imparted them the gifts only for members of the church. So it also shows that they too were under the spiritual oversight of the apostles and they were required to continue steadfastly the apostles' doctrine it's like every member of the church then to do so and today to do so. They had the Holy Spirit in men. We have the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. That is, if you want to know what God's will is, you can read about it. And it'll be the same thing they were teaching before it was ever written down. Um We've already talked somewhat about Cornelius. Um, I think the biggest thing I would show there was that they, and I've already emphasized this a couple of times, that uh, there was no involvement of miracles, power to speak in tongues or languages they never studied through the instrumentality of the Apostle Peter that it was directly from heaven that God said, 
really what he's saying. Everybody has a right to the gospel, and everybody in the Jewish church or any other church ought to be preaching the gospel to everyone else. Um, let's go over a little further to Ephesians chapter 19, I mean Acts chapter 19, about the Ephesians. Acts chapter 19. And um, you've got verses, uh, verse 1 through 17 that covers this. And this has to do with those 12 disciples of John the Baptist there in the city of Ephesus. And uh, Paul could see that they had not been taught the full gospel of Christ. They knew only the baptism of John. Well, as he says, John preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, uh, saying, believe on him who's coming after, which was Jesus, and they knew no more than that. Of course, uh, Achill and Priscilla had uh, got a hold of Apollos, who had been through Ephesus. No doubt he was the one that preached John's baptism. And after they had heard him preach, and he was a mighty orator, they realized his preaching was incomplete. And so they took him aside privately and taught him the word of God more fully, thus showing him the design and purpose of the things that John had said in the sense they had already come to pass in Jesus. Uh, this raises a lot of questions I can't answer. How did he just know that and not know the rest of it? But be that as it may, that's what the word of God says. And so when he finds out they had not obeyed the gospel of Christ, because to obey the gospel of Christ is to be baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? As the Samaritans had received it, they said, we don't know whether there is a Holy Spirit or not. We haven't even heard of it. So I told Paul, you haven't heard the whole story. And thus he taught them and then baptized him. So they needed more than just the message of John the Baptist out when it was of non-effect because it was over with. He came to preach and clear the way, if you please, to prepare the way for Jesus to come. Well, that's already happened. He's already died, buried, raised, ascended to heaven. The church has started, and the Great Commission baptism is in effect. So they had to be taught the truth on that, and, of course, it says they did. But that also proves to us that you can – I had one – let me put it this way. I had one person one time who had been baptized under Baptist baptism, and he had then married a woman who was a member of the independent Christian church. Well, while they're somewhat more conservative than the disciples of Christ, who are probably more liberal than Methodist, they just accepted him in on his Baptist baptism into the, into the uh, Christian church. Well, when somebody, and I don't know who, had come across them and taught them some years before, they didn't research their life like they ought to in the process of teaching them. He had learned since he'd been in the church that he had not been baptized according to the scripture. Well, he was concerned in his ignorance, honesty, but ignorant. Uh, do I have authority to be baptized a second time? I said, turn your Bible to Acts chapter 19 and tell me what happened there when those fellows realized that their baptism, that they humbly obeyed it, thinking that was what God required of them, was ineffective. Well, when he saw then that Paul baptized him scripturally, he said, let's get on with it. Uh, that's one reason we need to question people when they've had long years of being involved with denominations and all that stuff. I've even seen it happen to where people who were Baptist, and of course they immersed, and then years later, they're studying with somebody and they just know after they studied the scriptures reg regarding the reason one is baptized, and they just know they were baptized in Baptist baptism for the remission of sins. And I know of one or two cases to where they just, yes, I don't need to be baptized. I was baptized by a pastor so-and-so for the remission of sins. Well, what satisfied that situation was the preacher that baptized that person was still alive, and they contacted him, and they had her ask him, when you baptized me, did you baptize me in order for my sins to be forgiven? And he like to blew up over the phone. He said, no, I didn't do that. 
I baptized you because your sins were already forgiven when you believed. So people can get some strange things messed up in their mind, and they can do some transferring of what they've learned now to what they did at one time and confuse the whole thing. So it helps us to realize we need to ask some questions. We need to study with people. We need to find out for sure what they really do believe, what they really have done. So uh, that's a, this is a good example in Acts 19 for us to realize that you have a right to question people about their baptism. And that says then you can question them about anything when it comes to religion to make sure for their sake, for their own soul salvation, that they have truly from the heart been obedient to God's will and they haven't been fooled into thinking they have when they have not. That's as much a part of teaching the gospel as anything I can think of. Paul thought it was, and I can't outdo him. Let's leave that and look at some things that I would call great things in the book of Acts. You might say, well, the whole book's great, but uh, we'll emphasize some of these things that are listed specifically that we call great. First of all, the origin of the Church of Christ, chapter 2, 1 through 47. I have been around over my life, some places more than others, where they just hated to mention the, word, the term Church of Christ. Uh, I don't know why. I don't mind mentioning the New Testament of Christ uh, or anything like that. I don't mind mentioning that there's one Lord. In the same chapter in Ephesians 4 says there's one Lord, also says there's one baptism. And it says also there's one body. In Colossians 1 18 says that body is the church, there's only one church. But we're so afraid because they're so involved and imprinted upon them, branded on their conscience, the denominational concept of the church, that that'll just turn them off. So you members of the Church of Christ think you're the only ones going to heaven. Well, that's the denominational mind talking. That's the uneducated mind. That's the prejudiced mind. That's the mind that can only think in denominational terms. That's the reason we need to emphasize, I want to use the term Church of Christ as the New Testament uses it, as it defines it. And that's an opportunity to say, look, there are other scriptural terms, but if we refer to the body of the saved, why not refer to it like the Holy Spirit did? Uh, Romans 16, 16, the church is of Christ, salute you. But it's referred to as the church of God, it's referred to as the church, it's referred to as the body of Christ, it's referred to as the family of God. We need to use that to show that there are different terms of designation. There is no proper name for the realm of the saved. Now, there's a proper name for each member, and that's Christian. But there is no proper name for the church. And this is just an opportunity to teach when somebody starts on this business of, well, you folks in the Church of Christ think you're the only ones going to heaven. I know how Brother Tan answered that one time, says, I don't even think all of them are going to get there. Well, of course, that is the truth but because uh, you have to be faithful in the church. But it's an opportunity to teach. So you have the origin of the church of Christ. The way of salvation is a great thing. Chapter 2, 36 through 40. The worship of the church, chapter 2, 42 and chapter 20 and 7. The evangelistic message of the church. And you see then the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. You see the inability of Satan and all those who follow his lies and teach various lies. Well, a lie just contrary to what the Bible says, claiming to be the truth. You see all of that kind of thing used to try to hinder the progress of the church and destroy the church. And then, of course, uh, a Gentile's right to the gospel, chapter 11, 16, and 17. One of the interesting things I believe that we who are so familiar with the study of the New Testament and, and the names of the apostles and the early church seem so familiar to us. First of all, realize it's a closed book to a lot of people. They have no idea, more so now than it was a few years ago. But we need to note how did these country bumpkin, bumpkin fishermen, obscure Jewish followers of Jesus 
become renowned leaders. Well, of course, God gave them the wherewithal to accomplish. Jesus was working with them to understand that all the time that they were with him on the earth. And then through the baptismal measure of the Spirit, by their own will to serve God and their love of God, they were given the wherewithal to stand in the face of every kind of adversity and every kind of privation and persecution. And God was with them. Well, God says he'll be with us and no miracles today. But what he can do is beyond our mind to comprehend in providing uh, guidance and direction providentially and answering prayers, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, be instant in prayer. All these things are said over and over again. Praying, believing that you'll receive, and always acquiescing by saying, not my will, but thine be done. God will bless us. He'll do it in his own good time. He'll do it in the best way. Sometimes we know what needs to be done. We know the best way to do it. Then what caused men who first denied Christ uh, and actually ran away from him in the face of his adversaries, this ties into the first question, become bold advocates of the faith. Well, again, God gave them the wherewithal to accomplish what he called them to do. And uh, we have God's guidance and direction today, not miraculous. Let me mention this. Some people will ask the question regarding miracles when they have to do with healing. Do you believe in divine healing today? And my answer to that is absolutely. But I don't believe in miraculous healing. God has so made our physical bodies that they will redo themselves, repair themselves. Now you think about it. You go, you have something wrong with you, you have some sort of uh, illness. Now, what is able to be done by the doctor is to kill out the illness hurting your body. Your body's got to redo, and it can, to a great extent, uh, fight off disease anyway. I don't think we realize just how much the body has the ability to fight off all kinds of problems. Um, just get involved if somebody has an immune deficiency, and you'll see how our body can't really stand much without the ability to fight off germs and viruses and whatever. But you take, if you break your leg and the doctor sets the leg, it's the body that's still got to grow back together. You have surgery. Well, they're doing repair work, but they can't make it grow back together. They may help it, but it has to have the natural power to repair itself. So that's divine healing. It's not miraculous healing. Because miraculous sets aside the natural. The divine healing, God made us to where we would heal. So we need to know the difference in that which is of the divine and that which is miraculous. The two words are not parallel. They're not synonymous. Thus, I pray about me when I'm sick. But I don't expect a miracle. I believe it was Oral Roberts who used to say when he'd come on his, his television show, he'd say, expect a miracle. I remember being in Muskogee, and I wrote a lot of letters to the editors then, and there was a dentist of all people. When Nora Roberts was building his hospital in Tulsa, who wrote a letter to the editor, which they published, and he was uh, asking that People give to Oral Roberts to build that hospital. Well, I couldn't pass that up. I still have a copy of that letter. And I sent it, and they printed it. And I chided him greatly. I said, why in the world does Oral Roberts need a hospital? I've seen him on television for years, supposedly healing all these folks. And more was said. But uh, we need to know the difference in divine healing. Every one of you has been sick. You got over it. That was divine healing. None of you have ever experienced, and I have neither. Nobody else today has a miracle. 
So uh, another question, how did unlearned and ignorant men, chapter 413, lead such a moral spiritual revolution and reshape what really is the Western civilization? Well, you got to remember when they called it, when Luke calls them that, or he records what the chief priest called them. When he said unlearned and ignorant, it didn't mean they were stupid. It meant simply they had not gone through the formal schools of learning. But they were smart, and then God had given them the wherewithal, and they had the conviction and the courage of their conviction to do what needed to be done, and they were steadfast and unmovable in the doing of it. Well, I see that we are about out of time again. So we'll continue with some of these questions and then even move over to some other things, Lord willing, next week. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now.